On December 7, 1981, 45-year-old James Von Brunn entered the headquarters of the Federal Reserve in Washington, D.C. After writing his name on the sign-in sheet, Von Brunn explained to a security guard that he was a photographer intending to take pictures of the boardroom inside. After being told he'd have to wait, Von Brunn sprinted up the staircase and the security guard swiftly chased after him. Von Brunn was then met by another guard in a corridor and promptly pulled out a sawed-off shotgun. Before he could pull the trigger, Von Brunn was overpowered. In a bag slung over his shoulder, security recovered a 38 caliber revolver and a hunting knife. He then claimed to have planted a bomb in the building, which turned out to be a hoax, leading to the building being evacuated. He said he was distraught over high interest rates and the state of the economy. Driving throughout the U.S., through its countryside and urban areas, through cities and towns big and small, the corpses of industry litter the landscape. Abandoned factories, plants, and yards are reduced to overgrown and decaying structures. Whole towns and cities have been gutted by the void, causing a mass exodus of working-class communities. The factories that sustained the lives of millions of families were not killed off by the gradual and natural process of neoliberalism or Reaganomics, but by a deliberate policy exacted on the economy all at once. Indeed, Ronald Reagan has been a convenient scapegoat for liberals to unload all of the ills of the economy onto. And while his fiscal policies have set the stage for deregulation and cuts to social spending, causing a massive wealth redistribution to the upper crust, it is the monetary policy from just before his presidency which set the stage for the 1980s. The American post-war boom brought unprecedented prosperity. Millions of families became homeowners. The government subsidized cutting-edge industries that added to their global hegemony. But, of course, the side effect of a booming economy is inflation. The Federal Reserve is in the position of the chaperone who has ordered the punch bowl removed just when the party was really warming up. Inflation had become out of control in the 1970s, and by 1980, the Consumer Price Index showed an annual inflation increase of 13.5%, the highest it's ever been. President Jimmy Carter was sandbagged for the state of the economy, and therefore inflation was the Democratic Party's cross to bear. Carter made the decision to shake up monetary policy in a dramatic way, and would appoint a towering figure, both metaphorically and literally, as he stood at six foot seven, one of the most influential Federal Reserve chairs in its history, Paul Adolph Volcker Jr. Paul Volcker would be chosen to be the executioner of the economy, and the Federal Reserve marched in lockstep with big banks to achieve their aims. Now, this video isn't just about how private banks influence Federal Reserve policy. You'll have to watch my last Fed video for that, which is on the screen now. But just as a quick review, the Federal Reserve System consists of a board of governors in Washington and 12 reserve banks throughout the country. Back in 1979, the heads of the reserve banks were mostly chosen by the private banks in their districts. But what I didn't go over in my last video is the Federal Advisory Council, or FAC. Put simply, the FAC are private bankers chosen by the reserve banks who meet with the Board of Governors four times a year. In 1979, the FAC members included the chairman of the Board of Citibank, for example. On September 7, 1979, the FAC would have one of their routine meetings. It would prove to be one of the most consequential in modern American history. According to the minutes of the meeting, the bankers urged the governors to target the amount of money in the economy rather than concerning themselves with interest rates. To achieve this, interest rates would reach their highest levels in history. This monetary theory is otherwise known as monetarism and was popularized by Milton Friedman, probably the most influential economist of the 20th century, rivaled only by John Maynard Keynes. To show how impactful this meeting was, the Board of Governors would come to the same conclusion themselves three weeks later. The governors would not tell the president of their decision for a month. This is legal, because the Federal Reserve is not obligated to inform the President about their decisions. Indeed, neither the President nor Congress were consulted about this momentous event, and their experiment would be implemented in earnest on October 6, 1979. There wasn't any question that the Board knew that recession would follow. That's the penalty you have to pay for going out too far on the inflation side. 
Before March 31st, 1980, there existed laws against excessive interest rates, called anti-usury laws. There was even a cap on interest rates, called an interest rate ceiling. In the post-New Deal world, when interest rates hit their ceiling, depositors withdrew their money, which forced banks to stop lending. This naturally cooled down the economy. But on March 31st, 1980, President Jimmy Carter would sign the Monetary Control Act, passed through both the Democrat-controlled Senate and Democrat-controlled House of Representatives. In an instant, lending institutions and banks could now charge any interest rate on loans that they wanted. The social implications were obvious. Borrowers, businesses, and consumers would pay higher interest rates and creditors would enjoy higher returns on their wealth. The unregulated interest rates, coupled with the Fed's new tightening of money, would change the American landscape forever. The consequences would be far-reaching and varied. Just to put it in perspective, the federal funds rate, the most important interest rate metric, which refers to short-term interest rates between banks, is making the news now as of February 2023 for reaching its highest level in 15 years, of over 4%. By January of 1980, it would reach almost 14%. By April, it was nearly 18%. And after relenting for a brief period, the Fed would increase the Fed funds rate rapidly, up to 20% by January of 1981. What followed was the worst recession since the Great Depression. For nearly two years, the unemployment rate increased every single month. And by 1982, 12 million people were out of work, with millions more relegated to part-time, a total of as many as 20 million people. But the so-called dragon of inflation was slayed, and the inflation rate was curtailed to under 4%. What was the result of this? Well, the recession, as all recessions, was very profitable for banks and holders of large financial wealth, as explained in my last video about the Fed. Bankers enjoyed the high returns from loans made just before the recession and used the cheaper money from during the recession to invest and make even more money. Their cash and dollar-denominated assets started to appreciate due to low inflation, and they became extraordinarily wealthy. While construction, manufacturing, and farming took historic and permanent losses, 1981 produced more returns for banks than at any time in the 1950s, 60s, or 70s. And what did the banks do with all this wealth? Surely they invested it responsibly and carefully. Actually, they started loaning it to underdeveloped countries. To paint a picture of just how reckless and brazen American bankers had become, Nine of the largest U.S. banks' risk exposure, meaning the amount loaned compared to their capital, was over 200%. This meant that if a country defaulted on a loan, the loss would wipe out more than two times the money that the bank had on hand. For the poor countries, what economists call least developed countries, or LDCs, things became very bad during the recession. For starters, the Federal Reserve raising interest rates raised them around the globe. So countries had to pay more for their debt. But on top of that, they lost their most important export market, the United States. The lack of demand created what is now known as the LDC debt crisis. The Fed mobilized to facilitate currency swaps, swapping currencies with countries, giving them much needed dollars to back up their economies. This bided them enough time before the IMF would enter the equation. Starting with Mexico, the IMF would loan money to roughly 15 countries, culminating in the beginning of the era of the Structural Adjustment Program, or SAPs. SAPs were how the IMF would apply conditions to loans that included cruel austerity measures, including privatizing industries causing mass layoffs, suspension of price controls, wage cuts, and cuts to welfare programs in already miserably poor countries. These countries' budgets would be oriented toward paying back loans, which became impossible given the high interest rates, which compounded, creating a larger balance sheet for them to pay every year. This virtual Ponzi game would increase the debt burden for years to come. According to the World Bank, another partner in the destruction of developing economies, in 1982, the Caribbean and South America owed $330 billion in debt. By 1984, they owed $374 billion. As is widely known today, 
Developing economies have never recovered from the sweeping neoliberal reforms from the era of the Structural Adjustment Program. Over in America, unemployment reached 11%. Most of them were concentrated in the industrial sector, construction, mining, manufacturing. In fact, 23% of the automobile industry was unemployed, as well as 29% of miners and 22% of construction workers. Typically in periods of economic downturn and mass layoffs, the economy would pick back up and industrial workers were able to enter the job market once again. But in the 1980s, the manufacturing and industrial industrial sector withered away and died for good. There's a reason for that. To many Americans, the idea of devaluing the dollar sounds like a bad thing, even vaguely unpatriotic perhaps. A weak dollar must weaken our mighty nation. A strong dollar means a strong economy. You would probably be surprised to learn that the strong dollar is, more than anything else, the primary cause of the decimation of American manufacturing. This isn't a secret to economists and the board members of the Federal Reserve. The correlation between a strong dollar and weakening economy is well known. After the 2008 crash, the Fed governors and presidents discussed at their meetings how they were going to stimulate the economy. I won't go into quantitative easing in this video, that will be the subject of a future project, but in discussing their plan, the Dallas Federal Reserve Bank president spoke earnestly about their goals. Another desired benefit is to devalue the dollar to stimulate demand for our exports, and I don't think we should be saying that publicly. Put simply, when the dollar is worth less compared to other currencies, American goods become cheaper. So those exporting agricultural products, for example, are able to find buyers who will take a advantage of cheap American goods. This means more economic output, more jobs. The opposite happens when the dollar is too high. Foreign imports, like Japanese cars for example, have a competitive edge, and American producers and workers suffer as a result. Not only Americans, developing countries holding debt, which is paid back in dollars, have a heavier burden as well. In this way, the consequences span far and wide. Even the president of the New York Federal Reserve candidly admitted as much. We are decimating our our export industries. Volcker and I are extremely concerned about the long-term effects of the strong dollar. The rising dollar was caused by the high interest rates, which were higher than interest rates in other countries. Martin Feldstein, the Harvard economist and chairman of the President's Council of Economic Advisors, would agree. The fall in exports and the rise in imports that result from the stronger dollar are clearly causing unemployment and threatening individual firms with possible bankruptcy. The establishment economists knew better than anyone else what was going on. Even the architect of the operation, Fed Chairman Paul Volcker, relented that the dollar was a big mistake. I kept worrying about the dollar coming down with a thud, but by late summer of 1984, it became apparent that this was taking starch out of manufacturing. And that's putting it lightly. Jobs were extinguished, many of them high-wage unionized jobs. The destruction of the dollar was permanent. The high interest rates, the dollar, the unemployment, the outsourcing, all created a perfect storm, a sinister marriage of high interest rates and depressed wages. For the first time since World War II, the percentage of American families that owned their homes decreased. To quote William Greider, the old would lend their money to the young at higher prices than ever before. Young families forming in the 1980s, setting out to buy a car or their first home, would confront credit terms and interest rates that would have terrified their parents. Double-digit mortgages and floating rates that left them vulnerable to default. Homeownership, the central component of what was described as the American dream, would gradually shrink among the population, most dramatically among younger families. In one fell swoop, the decision to pass the Monetary Control Act in 1980 proved to be a fatal blow to the idea of a stable income, being able to live securely in America, owning your own home, and having wages reliably protected by strong unions. Democrats did this. To the enthusiasm of Republicans, no doubt, and the encouragement of Republican thinkers, namely Milton Friedman and Republican President Ronald Reagan. The economic legacy of the Democratic Party is merely a synthesis with the right to adopt conservative money policies. Democrats used their power to implement policies which were the brainchild of Milton Friedman. Democrats did the bidding of the right. This should be taught and remembered. I need your help. 
This channel relies on donations and patrons. YouTube hardly monetizes my videos. I am humbly asking those who have the means to consider giving me a donation. I have a link for donations in the description right now. Also, you should absolutely join my Patreon, which is also in the description. The cheapest option is just $1, and you get full access to exclusive content and my Discord server, where everyone is very cool and we talk about video ideas all the time. And if you have the means to do so, please consider donating, be it $5, $10, or more, whatever you can afford, and if you can't, please don't do it. If you can, it would be an enormous help, and I'd be forever grateful. Thank you so much to my patrons, I love you all, and I'll see you for my next video.